So it was about two and a half years ago that Matt Cremona designed and built his own bandsaw mill in Minnesota. Then we were all at an event earlier this summer and somebody got the idea I think it was me. Definitely you. Yep. It was me. That, was that we that should replicate the build here at my place in Texas. It took Matt four months. We have given ourselves five days. Let's see if we can get this done. Challenge accepted. Yeah. Of course. Actually, before jumping straight into the build, let me first explain what a bandsaw mill is and all of the prep work that went into the few weeks leading up to the guys arriving in my shop. A bandsaw mill is a piece of equipment where you can lay a log on its bed and slice it into slabs. This is footage of Matt Cremona running his mill. This is an alternative to using a chainsaw mill, which I showed you a few videos back. You can certainly buy a bandsaw mill right off the shelf. However, they are extremely expensive and most certainly are not made as well as this one. Because I know it will be asked, something with this cut capacity goes for around $75,000. And I was able to build this one for just under sixteen. dollars It has a 76 inch wide cut capacity and it is 12 feet long. It is probably larger than anything I'll be cutting here in the south, but since I was going through the effort of building one from scratch, I would much rather be over what I need than under. Oh, I'm almost at a loss on where to start on this one. But first off, this was a huge project to tackle in just a week, even with the four of us. Luckily, after Matt built his mill, he produced a set of plans for it, and he was kind enough to send me a set beforehand, which meant that I could order all of the hardware, parts, and steel needed for the project. Then the two weeks leading up to the build was dedicated to prepping and doing anything I could do in order to make the build go smoother once they arrived, which included sorting all of the hardware for the individual steps. See, I was able to order every single nut and bolt needed for this project, but it showed up in just one giant box. So my assistant Aaron went through and counted out the quantity needed, grouped together, and labeled the hardware for each portion. This way, whenever we got to, let's say, the carriage, we could go directly to that box that was labeled carriage, pull it out, and have all of the hardware needed for it. I also ordered all of the steel, which is around 4,000 pounds. I only have a 16 foot trailer, and if you haven't ordered steel before, the material comes in either 20 or sometimes 24 foot joints. And you can have the yard cut all of your pieces for you, but they charge a very pretty penny for each cut. So I went ahead and had them make one cut on each link just to knock down the size so that it could fit on the trailer, but then made the rest of the cuts in my shop. This task was made easier by a few things. One, Matt's plans provide a cut list for each part through the entire build. So I first tabbed the plan so that I could quickly move to each page showing a cut list. Two was the chop saw station I just built. And before this build, I was using the floor to cut long joints and having the station to work off of and have my material fully supported by its long wings was definitely a game changer. Then three is the Diablo Sermit blade, which is a pretty incredible blade. It's brand new technology from Diablo that mixes ceramic and metallic in the teeth. It not only produces little to no sparks when cutting metal, but it also makes such little heat when doing so that the steel is actually cool to the touch after making a cut. Oh yeah. It's hot? No, it's crazy. It's cool. Huh. You can touch it right after you cut it. And I don't know if you can pick it up from the footage here, but it also creates a burr-free finish, which means less time dedicated to cleanup work. Not only do these blades last 10 times longer than carbide tipped blades, but they also come in at a lower price point than carbide and diamond tipped blades. If you want to look at these sermon blades, I have a link for you below, but note that they do require a slow speed saw, something that operates around 1600 RPMs, instead of a traditional chop saw that operates around 4000. In just my personal system, after a part was cut to length, I would label it in a yellow paint pen before setting it aside. After all of the joint material was cut, I next moved to drilling and tapping all of the holes. And there is about two and a half days worth of drilling and tapping here. It isn't hard, but it is slow going because everything is so heavy and takes a second to move around. In fact, I was actually on light duty during this week and was restricted to not lifting anything over 20 pounds. Don't worry, I'm just fine. But you'll see Scott, who is my new part-time shop hand, moving things for me. If you've been following along, you'll know I recently built a new drill press stand for my woodworking shop. But for this build, with the joints and material being so long, I ended up using my Triton Super Jaws as side supports. With that, I used a plied wood box that was built based off of the Super Jaws height, which worked out really, really well. When it came time to tapping the holes, I ended up using a drill to get through it faster instead of manually doing it. 
and I've always known that you can drill and tap a hole, but there is a difference between understanding the concept of something and actually doing it yourself. I found tapping metal to be fascinating. For those of you who aren't familiar, tapping means that you cut threads into a hole that you just drilled. Whoa! <laughs> That's awesome! Meaning you can put a bolt anywhere without having to get to the backside and secure it with a nut. I asked Scott to take over tapping while I moved on to other things because there were still lots of other things to do before the guys arrived. Since I have a plasma CNC table, I decided to model all of the flat parts needed and cut them out on the plasma CNC. I again worked off of Matt's plans to put this cut list together. Three different thicknesses of steel are needed for the plan, so this material was picked up at the same time as all of the joint material. Now, getting these heavy sheets of steel up to the plasma table was a task all on of its own. As you can see, the tractor, a few straps, and Bessie clamps were called in here. By the way, I have no affiliation, but these straps here in the green and purple length were a huge asset. They have definitely earned a permanent spot in my shop after this project. But going back to the plasma CNC, I ended up having issues with the compressor running my table and therefore not being able to utilize it to cut all of the parts. And unfortunately, I thought this would be one of the quicker tasks, so I saved it till last. Meaning the guy showed up and I didn't have all of the parts cut yet. Thankfully, somebody in a nearby town was gracious enough to open up a shop on Super Bowl Sunday and cut out the remaining parts for us. So big thank you to him for saving our necks. My neck. It was my fault. <laughs> okay, and I think that about catches you up to what we're building and what is done up to this point. The last thing I had time to do was stage the parts needed for the first stage of the build, which is the enormous bed. So now let me introduce you to the build team so you know who is who. First up is Johnny Brook, who runs the channel Crafted Workshop. He is based in North Carolina and is an all-around maker, tackling projects of wood and metal and producing videos on how he does it. Next up is the master welder and fabricator of our group, JD. JD does this for a living, not bandsaw mills, but welding and fabrication. He is based out of Atlanta and can be found on Instagram under the handle Apexish. Then last but not least is the designer of the mill himself, Matt Cremona. Matt is actually a fine woodworker, but he learned how to weld and build a mill so that he could slab his own material. He's out of Minnesota and also runs his own YouTube channel. And I do have all of the guys' information linked for you down in the description. On day one, we were missing Johnny at the start of things because he had a later flight than the others, but we went ahead and got started due to the short time frame of things. Now, with all the parts of the bed already cut to length, drilled, and tapped, we kicked things off by prepping the areas where we would be joining together and welding. The steel comes off of the yard pretty dirty with mill scale all over it and sometimes rust. To get the best weld, the area should be cleaned off with a flap dust. And you'll see throughout the build, we hop back and forth between a battery operated grinder and a corded one, depending on the task. But I will say it was handy having both. The feet for the bed are made up from nut and bolts. This will give the mill adjustable feet so that when the mill is moved outside, we'll have a way to level up the bed to the uneven ground. The nut will be welded to the rail centered over a hole. And we used the bolt to keep the nut centered in this hole while we came through intact and then welded them into place. While I worked down one side, JD started on the other with Matt watching. See, Matt stick welded his entire bandsaw mill and has actually never MIG welded before. After watching JD through a hood, he got to try his hand at MIG for the first time. Awesome. <sighs> Needless to say, he loved it and took over the other rail while JD set up a third machine and started down the center. You liking it? It's, uh, it's got fun. <laughs> that was actually another big area of prep I did before the guys came in setting up gear and workstations to not only accommodate such a large scale build, but also multiple bodies working in the shop at the same time. For this project, we're using the Lincoln Electric PowerMig 210 machine and also the PowerMig 260 machine. After getting the feet in place, we started joining the frame of the bed together. For this step and quite a few others actually, we used the help of these awesome squares that I had never heard of before, but JD brought with him called fireball squares. They are machined perfectly square and come with tabs on them so that you can clamp them flush to your workpiece while also joining things at a perfect 90. After getting one positioned in each corner, we moved onto the very time intensive but important step of squaring up the frame and making sure that it was flat. And something I love about working with other people, 
occasionally, <laughs> is seeing other people's workflow and how it differs from yours. When it came time to measure for square, Matt and I were pulling out our tapes, but JD went to his bag of tricks and pulled out a laser tape measure. Measuring laser. What does Google say it's called? Huh. Google says it is a laser measure. That's, uh, that's pretty slick. Yeah, that is. This is way better. I would have never thought to use one, but apparently it's a go-to tool in JD's shop. And after this build, I can see why. So we used it to take diagonals of the frame and knocked it here and there until it read square. Your corner to my corner, we're trying to squish it. Get it hell. All right. <laughs> so can we weld now? Flat next. Flat next, okay. Next thing was to make sure that it was flat. So what we're doing is, this is going to pull tight against here, and then we'll be able to bring the two together so that this line will be the same as that one. Mm -hmm. To measure this, we strung out some string on a tight X formation and moved the corner feet up and down until the strings were just kissing one another at the crossing good. point. So let's down. Come down. All right. More? Yeah, a little bit more. You wouldn't want your carriage to be rolling along and it be coming up and down in different points because the bed's not flat. Next, JD tacked then welded the frame corners together while Matt and I started setting up the bed's cross members. To make this a little bit easier, we grabbed a bunch of scrap pieces of metal. It really doesn't matter what it is. And then clamped it to the long rails. It's funny because before this project, I truly thought I might have too many clamps. Nah. <laughs> I put every single one to use and there were there were several times where I went hunting for more. Assembling this bed is a great case in point. Now before actually welding these joints in place, we worked down the line with JD throwing a level on each one to make sure that they were sitting in their plumb. Then I threw in a few tacks when he said that they were good to go. You can see Matt in the background getting things ready for the next step of the build. After my tacking duties were done, I went ahead and joined him while JD did all of the finish welding. And man, a lot can he weld. Not only good, but fast. Dividing up tasks and having multiple things moving forward at the same time was a key component to cramming this project into such few days. Even though I did a lot of prep work, there were still a lot that I didn't get to and we had to do as we went. So while JD welded, we stayed out of his way, but kept ourselves busy with making other components. Although we also didn't hesitate to stop and take part or watch when something cool was going on. Such as when JD needed access to the underside of the bed to complete the weld and I got to use my new shop crate. This wasn't something I purchased for the build, it was just purely coincidental on timing, but man am I glad that it was around because there is a lot of heavy things on this build and it really came in handy. Okay, continuing on with the bed parts. Next, JD and Matt worked together to weld on what will be some supports or stops. The height of these are adjustable and will prevent the log from rolling off of the bed. Then the last step on the bed was to grind down the top weld so that a piece of angle iron could be added to the top so and to attached. This went really quick as the holes for the rail and the holes in the angle iron were part of the done beforehand pile. This meant we just had to go through and bolt it on. Look at this! <laughs> I know! Already! Already! How many hours have we done so far? Not that many. Not that many. Not even close. Wow. Stop being impressed with yourself. Get back to work. And that's it. I'm back to it again. <laughs> Now, the cross members on the bed actually get another piece of steel on top of them to protect them from getting beaten up, but it will also raise the level of the bed up to that angle iron. But the steel yard that I ordered my steel from left them off my load. It's not a big deal, but it is something that we'll have to add later on. Other than those top missing pieces, the bed was completely done. And we were pretty impressed and happy with ourselves for knocking it out so quickly. In fact, we got the entire bed done before Johnny arrived from the airport. So while he is missing from this episode, he was a vital part of this build and will be in the next part. Come together quickly. Very quick. You guys are in here. Johnny bro, go back to North Carolina. Yeah. I do think that is a good stopping point. So in the next video, we'll be continuing on with the build, building out the carriage. Of course, check the description if you want any information on the guys on the build team, anything used in the video, or even links to Matt Cremona's bandsaw mill plans. I'm excited about this one, so I hope that you're enjoying it so far. I'll see you on the next one.